Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I uh, This has been a very difficult day here, and I'm sure for you guys, uh, wherever you are, anybody who's watching the news, this has not been an easy day at all. Um, we will keep in mind what's happening and uh, Davin, that there should be peace and good leadership, as my friend Sarah said. Um, okay, today we are going to our second class in our new Yerushalayim series. Uh, and today we are going to a neighborhood that is not so well known, and it's really a very, very interesting neighborhood um, called Musrara. Okay, uh, and we'll explain what is the this picture a little bit later. Where's Golda Meir? Why is the alley called not nice? We'll get there. But Musrara is uh, it's a, it's a neighborhood that has had many transitions over time. Uh, it, we're going to see exactly where it is in a few minutes in case it's not a familiar name to you. It's really in the center, center of Jerusalem, near the old city, near City Hall, near Mea Sharm. It's near everything. Um, but it's not a very big neighborhood. Uh, it began as a suburb, a wealthy suburb outside of the old city. Uh, then as when Israel became a state in 1948 uh, and the city was divided, Jerusalem was divided, it became a real slum because it was on the border. Um, it became renewed in the 70s. And today it, it's a neighborhood that's really in transition. Uh, it's partly ultra-Orthodox. It's partly kind of a, a funky, interesting art center. Uh, it's got a lot of different components to it. So we're going to try to explore the history and some of the historical buildings and also a little bit of a look at what it is today. Um, the picture, like I said, is a, a street sign. We're going to talk about the names of the streets, but we have uh, we have a few that are connected to a movement called the Black Panthers, not the Black Panthers in America, but Hapanterim Hashorim, the Israeli Black Panthers, who basically began in the streets of Musrara and had an effect not just on their neighborhood, but really on the whole country. So that's what this is relating to, but don't worry, we'll come back to it. Okay, so where are we? Just to understand, uh, this is not, like I said, it's not a very big neighborhood and certainly the, the interesting historical core of the neighborhood is not big at all. Um, just wanna move this so I can see what I'm doing. Um, so we, we are gonna look, the neighborhood actually goes a little bit to the north of Rehov HaNeviim, of the Street of the Prophets. We're not going to go that far. We are going to start here by the Museum on the Seam, which used to be the place of the Mandelbaum Gate, right? The one crossing point between, um, between Jerusalem, uh, uh, Jordanian East Jerusalem, and uh, Israeli West Jerusalem. Okay, so that's going to be our northern point. Okay, we're going to go down here in the west, uh, in the east, excuse me, uh, in the east down uh, towards route number one that used to be the border. Okay, going down towards the walls of the old city and coming back up by this street, Shifte Israel. Okay, so you can see it's not a particularly big area. Just to understand where you are, if this doesn't say that much to you, okay, Old City is over here, right, in the ba bottom here, Nablus Road, Derech Shechem, very important thoroughfare coming out of Sha'ar Shechem, out of the Damascus Gate, over here, okay, center of town, uh, you know, Ben Yehuda, etc., over here. And City Hall, Safra Square over here, down here. Okay, so this is the area that we are in. Um, and like I said, we're going to really be looking south of Rehob HaNeviim, even though technically Musrara continues to the north, but those are not really the interesting old buildings. Okay, I hope that's clear. We'll probably end up coming back to this map at some point. But meanwhile, uh, this is useful enough for us right now. Okay, um, and as we could see in the map, the this is a neighborhood that is really in the mix of, uh, like it's a classic, what we call Ravi Yerushalmi, right? A Jerusalem mix. Jerusalem is an exceedingly diverse city um, and forget about the tourists that come, just the residents. Uh, and Musrara is really on the edge of many different neighborhoods, okay? We are very close 
to the Haredim of Me'asharim. Let's just step back a minute for a minute here. Okay, if we are by Shivtei Israel and Rehov HaNibiyim, Me'asharim area is right out here, okay? We are very close to the Arabs of the old city and of the area of Derech Shechem and Sheikh Jarrah and over here. But we're also very close to downtown, regular, boring Jewish Jerusalem, right? All those different pieces uh, are very close to Musra. Uh, and, and is going to impact on the type of people who originally moved there and who are living there today. Okay, so that's just to, to keep us uh, in mind. We're also on the border uh, of a lot of interesting institutions. Okay, so one of them is City Hall, Safra Square. That's what you see over here on the left. This is the new City Hall that was built in the 80s. Okay, but if you've ever been to the 90s, excuse me, okay, this is uh, built in the 90s by the, the Mexican millionaire Edmund Safra. And this whole big public square was put here in order to be like a gathering place and all kinds of events. Didn't really work out that way. People mostly come to City Hall to pay their taxes. It's not a very beloved institution, but it's an important institution. But right next to it are the older parts of City Hall that go all the way back to the British. Okay? A lot of the older buildings that are here. Um, between 1948 and 67, which is going to be a lot of our story of Musrara, City Hall was on the border, was really on the border. And if you come to Jerusalem and you see the old building of City Hall, you can see it's pockmarked with all kinds of uh, you know, shell holes because it was on the border. It was in a place that was that was shot at, that was dangerous. Um, but between 48 and 67, Israeli Jerusalem, Jewish Jerusalem did not move City Hall. This was a, a symbolic idea that we're not moving it away from the border because we believe that one day the city will be reunited. Uh, and today the city has been reunited and City Hall stays here. Very close by, right behind City Hall, is a much older area called the Russian Compound, okay? uh, which was built as the very first uh, move out of the old city by a Christian institution and one of the very first altogether, and that's the Russian Church. They move out of the old city and they establish hostels for their pilgrims to stay in uh, a church, all different kinds of buildings, which today have been repurposed for all sorts of uh, all sorts of things, including police headquarters in Jerusalem, including city um, uh, courtrooms, uh, and including, as you can see over here on the right, what the British repurposed one of the buildings for, and that was the central prison of Jerusalem. Okay, so the Russian compound, one of the, the buildings, the women's hostel, was taken by the British. They used it as the main prison in Jerusalem. Today, that prison has been turned into a museum called the Museum of the Underground Prisoners, all about this time period when the British are here and the Jews fighting in the underground movements for freedom and for sovereignty. So that's the underground prisoners. Uh, and in the middle here is one other neighbor, which is also very interesting and definitely worth a visit when you you come to Jerusalem, uh, and that's one of the oldest buildings on the edge of Musrara. Okay? It's called Yad Lakashish. Uh, it's, a, it's a building that goes back to the 1880s. It was actually a, an English bishop's house. But since the 1960s, since 1962, it's housed this amazing organization called Lifeline for the Old Yad Lakashish, which started in 1962. There was a teacher named Miriam Mendelov, and she saw, right, Israel in the 60s, not exactly a, a, an economic powerhouse, uh, and a lot of older people, she saw a lot of older people who basically had no income and nothing to do with their days, and they were in very bad shape. Uh, and she started by creating a, a book finding workshop for them to be employed in, and this grew, uh, and today they they are celebrating um, 60 years, 60 years last year, right? Um, and um, and they, they employ all sorts of elderly from 
many different countries, Ethiopians, Russians, but all different, uh, in wood workshops and crafts, and, and they make all kinds of beautiful things that are then sold in a store there. So it's really a wonderful organization. And that's Yad La Kashish. All of these are on the edges of Musrara. Oh, very nice. Susanna writes, her motto was, to be is to do. That's very nice. Thank you. I did not know that. Um, okay, so these are on the edges of Musrara. Let's take a look at our timeline. Always useful. Okay, so uh, in the first and second temple periods, we are outside the city, right? That shouldn't be too hard to understand. We're outside the old city. This was an area for burial, but nobody was living here. By the end of second temple times, by the first century of the common era, Jerusalem expands. We're going to see this uh, in a minute. The third wall is built. Jerusalem reaches its largest size that it's going to be until the 19th century. And this area of Musrara, part of it, at least on the edges, uh, is part of Jerusalem. Okay, But all of that falls apart when the Second Temple is destroyed. Nothing is happening out here. And it begins to become interesting to us again uh, in the late 19th century, okay, 1889. We have the beginnings, beginnings of wealthy Arabs, both Muslims and Christians, uh, uh, who start to build in Musrara. Now, the majority of the houses, the really nice houses, the impressive houses, are Arab houses. But not only, there were also some Jewish homes, and that's uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, and one of them is uh, somebody named Shmuel Beck, the son of Nissen Beck, who was a big builder in, in Jerusalem, built the Tiferet Israel Synagogue, built a neighborhood. So he builds a house in Musrara. Okay, then we have another Jew, Shmuel Strois, who buys this house and makes it a, a hectic, makes it a place that is can only be used for certain purposes, right? And it's for Torah scholars. We also have nuns, right? This is a very diverse neighborhood. 1905, uh, an order called the Silesian Sisters buy a property and they start to settle in Musrara, right? So by 1948, you have this very interesting neighborhood, mostly middle to upper class, right? Muslims, Christians, a few Jews, um, all of it kind of part of this booming Jerusalem that's growing outside the walls of the old city. Of course, all of that comes screeching to a halt uh, with the War of Independence in 1948. November 48, the war is over in Jerusalem. It's not over in the rest of the country, but it is over in Jerusalem by September, ceasefire. Uh, and in November, the Jordanian general Abdullah Atal and the Israeli general Moshe Dayan draw the ceasefire lines of Jerusalem they are sitting in Musrara while they are doing that. So it really is this meeting place between the two armies. Between 48 and 67, Musrara is on the border, like many places on the border, both in Jerusalem and in the country in general. A lot of new immigrants are settled slash dumped here, right? Because they have nowhere else to go and the government tells them to go here. Um, once the city is reunited in 1967, things start to change. Right, we're going to see that there is a call for um, economic, uh, socioeconomic renewal, and that's the Black Panthers that's starting here in Musrara. Meanwhile, as Musrara begins to improve, right, with Project Renewal, with Menachem Begin, you also have more art institutions that are moving in. So we're going to see the print workshop, the art school, an urban art project, right? All kinds of interesting projects that are having here, happening here. So you basically have essentially three periods up until 1948, fancy, wealthy, outside the walls neighborhood, 48 to mid 70s, a slum, a real slum uh, of all different kinds of immigrants. And from the late 70s till today, renewal, gentrification, but also a strong move into the neighborhood of ultra-Orthodox, because realize we're right next door to Masharim, right? The ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods are mostly in the north of the city. As the population expands, the reach expands as well. And so you have an ultra-Orthodox group that's moved into Musrara also, not always the friendliest combination, right? So that, that's something to keep in mind as we go on. Okay. Um, yes. First, let's go back in time, right? Third wall of Second Temple, Jerusalem. Um, 
I, I have to say it's not a very impressive archaeological site, but it's probably one of my favorite archaeological sites just because it's so unlikely. Uh, if you walk along Derech Shrem, let's go back to where that is, right? If you walk along Nablus Road over here, you come very close to the end here, right? Right about here, very close to where Masharim is, and you come to a gas station. And in the courtyard of the gas station, literally in the courtyard of the gas station, you can see the gas station in the background here, is the third wall of Jerusalem, okay? And the street is named after it. It's called Third Wall Street, Rehob HaChoma HaShlishit. So, you know, sometimes we take our archaeology for granted. Uh, it's a little sad, but it's just a little crazy that in the gas station we have... Uh, we have the third wall of the city. So where exactly were these walls? So let's go back to Second Temple times just for a moment. We are going to come back to modern times, but it's still interesting to see this, right? Josephus tells us about three walls that Jerusalem had, okay, in Second Temple times. The first one, well, it really it's four, but Josephus doesn't tell us about four, but we'll pretend for a minute that he does. The first wall is with Shivat Zion, is when the Jews return from Babylonia and they have this very narrow city over here encompassing part of the city of David and the Temple Mount. By the time you get to the Hashmonaim, the Hasmoneans, you have Josephus's first wall. The city grows and it basically looks like the city of late first temple times. That's the first wall, okay? And we have remnants of this, we found pieces of it. By the end of the first century before the common era, the city has expanded again. And we have something called the second wall, which is not so clear where exactly its boundaries are but this is how we tend to draw it, leaving outside the city, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, meaning if Jesus is really buried there, it can't be inside the city, but that's a story for another time. And by the end of Second Temple times, by the time we get to the last few decades uh, of, uh, of the first century of the Common Era, the city has expanded yet again to the north. And this already is outside the walls of the current old city. These are the walls of the current old city, right over here. This is much further and it encompasses the area of the Russian compound and it encompasses part of the area of Masharim, right? And all the way out towards Derech Shrem and of course our third wall, that's basically right just about over here. Okay, so that's just to give a sense of what we're talking about, but it only is part of Jerusalem at the very tail end of Second Temple times. Before that and after that, this is not, this is outside the boundaries of Jerusalem, but still interesting to know about uh, and, and to be aware of. Okay, like I said, we are going to jump ahead to the 19th century. Okay, uh, and we have building outside the walls now. We are familiar, and we did this in the last time we did this course, we talked about Yumin Moshe and Jewish uh, building Jewish neighborhoods outside the walls. Basically, by mid 19th century, the old city has become way too overcrowded. Uh, and each group, each religious group decides that they are going to move outside the walls but each one is doing so for a very different reason, okay? The Jews is the one that we are the most familiar with, that, that we know the story of. The Jews leave the walls because there's no space. There's physically no space. You have more immigration. You have uh, a better, uh, you know, better uh, life expectancy. Babies aren't dying as much. People are living a little bit longer, and you just don't have space for all these people inside the walls. And so the Jews overcome their fear of being outside the protective walls. They move out first to Mishkin Ochananim, and then they start building neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood, residential neighborhoods, okay? Christians 
different story, Christian institutions, okay? Christian institutions with ties to Europe, the Russians, the French, the British, the Germans, everybody wants to have a foothold in the Holy City. Everybody knows that the Ottoman Empire is about to fall apart. They all want to build something, right? So they buy a plot of land and they build hostels for their pilgrims and they build churches and they build hospitals, right? And that's where we get the Russian compound and the English hospital uh, and the Italian hospital and many, many more. The third group are Arabs, okay? Muslims, but also some Christians, but not Europeans. Ones who live in the country, in many cases, families that have been in Jerusalem for centuries upon centuries, right? The Nashashibis, the Husseinis, the Dajanis. And they say, we don't wanna live in that crowded, dirty, ugly old city. We wanna move outside, but we're not building residential neighborhoods. We're not building institutions. Rather, the families are building beautiful, big family compounds. And we have this in places like Sheikh Jarrah, and we have this in places like Derek Shrem, and we have it here in Musrara. Christian Arabs, Muslim Arabs who say, I wanna build myself a nice house for my family. And that's the most beautiful old houses in Musrara, that, that's what they are, right? They are these Arab families, middle and upper class families who build in the style that is called a liwan, a courtyard in the front, rooms all around the side, right? It's a very traditional Arab style, usually large multi-generational uh, families, okay? And this is one of, th these are two buildings that are connected by an outside bridge that are still existing today on Rehov Daniel uh, in, um, in Musrara. And this is uh, an old house. Now, these houses were built for families. What happened eventually is that in the 50s, when you're shoving all these new immigrants here, you're taking these one family, okay, maybe a multi-generational family, but still a one family house, and you're subdividing it up into little tiny sections and, and sticking all these new immigrants inside in barely livable conditions. But that's, we haven't gotten to that stage yet, okay? The picture on the right here is uh, a view to the old city from Musrara in the 1930s. Obviously, much more has been built up, but the truth is Musrara is on a hill. Musrara actually means uh, charming in Arabic, full of charm, uh, and it really is very charming. Uh, and even today, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be up on a 12-story building in order to have this view. You really do have this view, even though much more has been built up. But if you stand uh, on Shivte Israel Street, you're basically at the top of the neighborhood and you look down and you can see, uh, you can see the Mount of Olives over here and you can see the Temple Mount. You really do have that beautiful view. Um, okay, when we you walk around in Musrara, the older buildings, the Arab buildings are these buildings that have beautiful uh, architectural details. Um, uh, some of them, like the picture on the right, you actually have dates on the houses, which is great because that tells us, you know, tells us when it's from. And you can see this one in particular, a lot of the houses have this. They have the Western date on the top, 1896, but then they have the date in Arab numbers on the bottom, right? So it's uh, that, that will tell you um, that this is a, an old Arab house. This building on the on the left here is one of, is probably the most well known building in Musrara, the most unusual building, Beta Chalonot, right, the house of the windows for obvious reasons. I um, not built, as far as I know, for any reason to have all these windows, but mostly just for beauty, uh, the different styles, the different sizes and shapes and kind of uneven and really very beautiful. Today, this building has uh, has become, the bottom floor of it at least, is a center for uh, Eastern music. And it's one of the very interesting institutions in this neighborhood. Um, the older houses, the Arab houses, are mostly on three main streets, on Rehov Daniel, uh, on Rehov Hulda, and on Rehov Natan Navi. All of these are names that were given, obviously, later eh, by Israel. We'll talk about the names of the streets in a little bit. Um, 
And also, like many neighborhoods in Jerusalem, like Baca and Katamon and Talbia, this all becomes what's known as Rechush Natush, abandoned property after 1948, right? The Jews leave the property that they had in the old city. The Arabs leave the properties that they had in the new city. Um, and this all kind of comes under the control of the state, right? You also have the same idea in the German colony where all the German Templars left. So there's a, there's a very big real estate uh, uh, confusion that's going on uh, in the early years of the state. Um, if we're talking about Arabs who are moving in here, right? This is a neighborhood that is uh, a center for Arab intellectuals, right? We said middle to upper class. So there are a lot of intellectuals here who are here. There are also a lot of Arab nationalists. They definitely are not supportive of a Jewish state. Again, all before 1948. Um, two that I'll just highlight for you here, right? The guy on the left, his name is Araf al Araf. Um, he was born in 1891. He died in 1973. He was a journalist. He was a historian. He was a politician, but he wasn't exactly an intellectual who sat in the library all day. Uh, he incited uh, to the Arab riots of 1920. Um, and you can see here how he's dressed with his uh, with his sword. Um, he flees from the British because the British, of course, do not you know like the idea that there's incitement to riots. But when he comes back, uh, the British do something that they do a number of times, and that's in the hope of moderating these very radical nationalists, they appoint them to official positions, right? They did the most famous person they did that with is Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem. Uh, he, he's appointed to be the religious leader of Jerusalem in the hopes that this will kind of temper his radicalism. It went the exact opposite direction. Same thing here, Arafat Araf is appointed to be the ruler of Beersheba. It does not make him any less radical. Uh, in the 1950s, he's the mayor of Jordanian East Jerusalem. So he's our figure here on the left. On the right uh, is a doctor, Dr. Tafik Nan. And he's born in 1882. Uh, he's a Christian. He's a doctor. He's an ethnographer. He studies Christian uh, amulets. Okay? He's an Arab nationalist, but he's also a very important doctor. He directs the leper uh, hospital in Hansen House. He directs the deaconess hospital. He's the head of the Palestinian Arab Medical Association. So you get a sense of these are people who are smart, who are educated, and who are very strong Arab nationalists. And that's what the neighborhood looks like largely, but not only. We also have some Jewish families, OK? Uh, if any of these ladies look familiar, I hope, uh, I would assume at least Hillary Clinton looks familiar, right? but we're not talking about her. Um, we are talking about the lady on the left side of the picture. Her name is Ruma. Okay? Uh, and then the second picture on the right side of the picture is a woman named Ruth. Ruma and Ruth are sisters. They were from the Schwartz family. Um, and they became slightly more famous when they got married. Ruma became Ruma Weitzman. Uh, she was uh, the wife of Azer Weitzman. Uh, Ruth Schwartz became Ruth Dayan. She married Moshe Dayan. Um, they were the Schwartz family and they lived in a house on the edge of Musrara. Today that house has been since the 90s is the home of the film school, the religious film school of Maale, another really interesting institution in the neighborhood. Um, but they were also there. It was not only uh, an Arab area. And again, we mentioned this in the beginning, you also had Jews who moved in. Right. So um Shmuel Beck, that's not who this is. We'll talk about who this is in a minute. Hey, Shmuel Beck was the son of someone named Nissen Beck. Nissen Beck was um, a Jew, an Ashkenazi Jew, came from Tzfat to Jerusalem, uh, very involved in building up Jerusalem. The most famous thing that he built is the Tiferet Israel Synagogue, uh, one of the big, beautiful synagogues in the Jewish quarter that was destroyed by the Jordanians in 1948, along with the Churva. Just as the Churva has been rebuilt, the Tiferet Israel is now in the process of being rebuilt. It's it's getting close to being finished. Um, Shmuel Beck is Nissen's son, okay? and he builds a house here. 
in Musrara. Uh, and it's bought by another good Jew named Shmuel Strois. And Shmuel Strois says, I'm buying this house, but I'm not buying it for myself. I'm buying it as what's called a hektish, right? It's going to be kodesh, right? It's going to be set aside uh, to be used as a Beit Midrash and a home for Torah scholars. That, that's what he wants it to be used for. He doesn't want it to be used for any secular purposes. So he basically provides rent-free housing for Torah scholars. Uh, one of them, probably the most famous one who lives in this house is this gentleman over here, whose name is Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank. Mayor of Tzvi Pesach Frank, um, born in 1873, died in 1960. Uh, he was the chief rabbi of Jerusalem. Uh, from, uh, from 1935, he was very close with Rav Arya Levine, he was very close with Rav Cook, uh, very, very important figure. He's uh, involved in freeing chained women, Agunot. He very much wanted to have one unified community, one Beit Din for everybody, uh, religious, not religious, Ashkenazi inspired him. Obviously, these things did not work so well, out so well, but that was his vision. Um, and, uh, and he lived in this house for a while. Um, okay. Let's talk for a minute about, um, yeah, someone talking. Okay. Let's talk for a minute. Of, that was Mesquite. Yes, that was Mesquite. The picture over here. Let's go back for a second. Yes, this, this is Mesquite, which was the very, famous in the 60s and 70s uh, Israeli clothing company, which has now, by the way, been restarted. If you have a very nice clothing budget, go shopping in Mesquite. Otherwise, forget it. Super expensive, um, but beautiful, interesting Israeli designs. Okay, before we get to the story of the Ayn Chet, let's talk about some of the other names uh, of the streets in the neighborhood. Obviously, the, the neighborhood got... The streets got new names uh, with the state of Israel. Today, the streets of Musrara are named primarily for um, for prophets, right? It's on the edge of Rehov HaNevi'im, the prophet street. So the streets are named after various prophets. We have Rehov Daniel, Rehov Elisha, Chulda, right, a prophetess, uh, Natan Hanavi, right? not necessarily the most famous of the prophets, but certainly some important ones. Um, and we also have the Ayin Chet, we'll talk about that in a minute, and the and the Black Panthers, but just interesting to know, right, we think of the Hebrew names of the streets, okay, we say that, of course, that's what the names are, that makes sense, but a lot of names in the time of the British were very, very different, and they were changed by Israel when, uh, when we came into power in 1948, so in our area, it's just interesting to note, right, the British named the street that today is called Rehov Elisha, very important thoroughfare Musrara was named Baldwin the first right after one of the crusader kings not exactly a uh, Jewish hero um recall that Queen Helene Helene Hamalka was named after Queen Melisand another crusader queen of Jerusalem uh Ha'ayin that we're going to talk about right now was named for Godfrey of Bouillon okay? Godfrey of Bouillon conqueror of Jerusalem massacre of many Jews and Muslims okay so the names somewhat different than they were then um okay Let's talk about one of the the main, probably the main street of Musrara, and that's Rechov Ha'ayin Chet. Uh, people who come to Israel and you know they don't necessarily know Hebrew, and they certainly don't know Gematria. They don't understand what is this name Ha'ayin Chet Ha'ach, right? What is this Ayin Chet? Of course, is a number, right? Seventy eight. Uh, and who are the seventy eight? The seventy eight are uh, in memory of the people who were killed in the Hadassah convoy, which, by the way, now we know was 77 and not 78, but nobody's going to change the street anymore. Um, what's the story of the Hadassah convoy? Uh, on April 13th, the 4th of Nisan, 1948, there's a convoy of doctors and nurses and patients that is going up to Hadassah Hospital. Now, remember, before the War of Independence, there was one Hebrew University, there was one Hadassah Hospital, both of them were on Mount Scopus, right, because that was going to be the future of Jerusalem, that was going to be where all the modern places were going to be built, and that started in the 20s. Um, 
But in 1948, of course, uh, Mount Scopus is very much surrounded by Arab areas. Uh, it's an area under fire. Um, and there's a convoy that's heading up there because it's still a, a running you know, a hospital that's still running. Uh, and the night before, the Haganah had looked out at the road. Now, it's not the road of Ha'einchet. We are talking about a road that is further to the north and the east, uh, the road that goes up to Mount Scopus. It's called Dera Har Um, But between 48 and 67, that was in Jordan. So you couldn't commemorate the story on that actual street. You could only commemorate it on the street that was within Israeli hands. So the actual street is north and east of Einchet of today. Um, Haganah members who were doing lookouts, right? They noticed that it's kind of suspicious. There were a lot of sandbags on the roofs. In the morning, as the convoy was about to set out, they saw that the street was very eerily quiet. They, they, they were uneasy about the whole story, but the British said, no, 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 everything's fine, don't worry. The convoy sets out uh, and, of course, is immediately attacked. The first armored car uh, a bomb goes off in front of it, and it's, of course, stuck, and the cars behind it are stuck. Some of them manage to get out, but many do not, uh, and the Arabs come out and basically massacre the people who are stuck there. Um, the British, for their part, do very little. They show up many, many hours later, um, and, uh, and this was just a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, it happened in the wake of the attack, the Jewish attack on the Arab village of Dir Yassin, okay, which is very disputed what happens there, but what's undisputed is that the Arabs told wild stories about Jewish massacres there, and it, it frightened the Arabs very much, and many of them started to flee, and also this was considered a revenge attack. Uh, and part of that, by the way, is why the British don't respond, because they say, oh, the Jews killed the Arabs, let the Arabs kill the Jews. It's a very, very horrific tragedy, um, and it basically means that uh, Mount Scopus stops being used as a hospital, uh, and Hadassah has to move to all sorts of temporary quarters, and eventually a new structure is built in Ein Karim, and only after the Six-Day War do we move back to the hospital that's on Mount Scopus. So we have a few memorials for this story. One is naming the street Ha'ain Chet in Musrara. Another is um, a mass grave uh, that... Uh, that you can see here. And there's also a memorial on Mount Scopus. Um, and, and today, now that the city has been reunited, there's also a memorial uh, in the actual place of where this happened. Of the 77 who were killed, obviously all of the stories are terrible stories, but some stand out more than others. Um, so two of the people who were killed uh, one is the Chaim Yaski, who's on the left here. Uh, Chaim Yaski was the head of Harat Sofim. He started his career as an eye doctor. He was very involved in creating the medical school of Hadassah. He was very important, involved in public health, did all kinds of incredible things. He was on this convoy, and he was one of the people who was killed. So he was somebody who was rather famous who was killed. Somebody who was much less famous, but our story is such a powerful story, is Hana Kasuto. So here in the picture on the right, you can see uh, Hana Kasuto in much happier days uh, with her husband, Natan. They were Italian Jews, um, three little children. When the war, when they were caught uh, in the middle of the war in Italy, in the middle of World War II, she already has a little baby. They are separated, so they have four children. The two of them are separated. He's a rabbi and uh, works as much as he can to save his community, works with the resistance. She's separated from him. They eventually are both sent to the camp separately. They're separated from their children. Her baby dies. He dies probably on a death march. She survives. She survives, and somehow, amazingly, the three children survive. Uh, and all of them make it to Israel separately. Now, if the name Kasuto sounds a little familiar to you, okay, if you know you know a little bit about Bible studies, about Parshanut, uh, it's because her father was Umberto Kasuto, Moshe David Kasuto, okay, the very great Bible scholar who had already come to Israel before. Now, she comes to Israel, the children come to Israel, they are reunited 
They're taken in, of course, by her father-in-law and her mother-in-law. They live with the Casuto family. And she gets a job. She gets a job uh, working in a lab on her uh, And she's on that fateful convoy as well. So after all she had suffered in, in surviving the war and coming to Israel, she is murdered in this convoy. Uh, her children were brought up by their grandparents. And her son is David Casuto, who's a well-known architect and who's very involved in the Italian Jewish Museum in Jerusalem. So just two of the, the 77 stories uh, of the Ein Chet. Um, so um, in the municipality, in the city council. There, he's on the city council. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Um, okay. When the war is over in Jerusalem, um, the two generals, Atal and Diane, sit down to draw the border. Uh, and story has it that they sit down in an abandoned house in Musrara. Where is this abandoned house? That's a very good question. Nobody has really pinpointed where it was exactly, so we don't know. But we do know, and this is urban legend, but, it, but it's not a legend, it's true, that they sit down on the floor, they have this map, and basically what do they have to do? They have to mark each of their positions so that they can draw the ceasefire lines. And they use thick wax crayons, um, which they're not stupid. They understand that whatever they draw is going to be magnified in real life, right? If it's an inch across on the map, it's, you know, 10 meters in real life or whatever. They understand that that's going to be a problem, but they're not worried because they know that, uh, that very soon they're going to make a real map. This is just the draft of a map. But uh, there's nothing more permanent in the Middle East than something temporary. And this is not only the, the only real map. It's not only the real map. It's the only map, right? It's put in a safe in the United Nations headquarters uh, in Armona Natsiv. And every time that there's any kind of a border dispute, it's taken out and it's consulted. But because it's written in this crazy way, you have all kinds of abnormalities along the way that are called the thickness of the line, right? And it's very unclear, right? The Jordanians are marked with a red pencil. The Israelis are marked with a green pencil. But you have places where it's unclear. Who does it belong to? Is it no man's land? Is it Jordanian? Is it Israeli? Is it both, right? Because of this thickness of the line. Um, and you have a lot of absurd situations that happen because of that. Um, but take a look at the border, all right? So where are we? We are Musrara, right? Over here, literally on the border, right? Um, so meaning not only do they not have room to expand, of course, but you are in danger of all of the problems that you have on the border, meaning snipers, meaning garbage, uh, barbed wire, mines, right? Nobody comes to clean things up. This picture on the right is a famous picture. You can see Migdal David, right? The Tower of David in the background. This is right by Jaffa Gate. This is what things look like, right? It was just this desolate, terrible area. And this is where people are living. Now, um, the border is not an easy place to live. Uh, it's, it, it, this, is, um, this is a picture of Notre Dame. I know Notre Dame was on the Israeli side of the border. It was largely, uh, a large piece of it was wrecked uh, in uh, the battles in 1948. Uh, Israel blows up a wing of Notre Dame so that the Jordanian tanks cannot progress towards Western Jerusalem. Um, there's an Israeli outpost on the roof, and people have told me that they went up to the roof when they came to Israel in the 60s and you could look into the old city, right? Um, but you really had this border going down the middle of the city. The picture on the right here is Abu Tor. Abu Tor was a neighborhood that was divided between the Israelis and the Jordanians. Um, life on the border had, was very tense. Um, it wasn't exactly a very uh, quiet time in Jerusalem, not in the sense of attacks. There were very few attacks. There were some, but very few. But you're living in a city that you walk to the end of the street and there's barbed wire and there's walls and the city can't expand and there's almost no tourism. Um, despite the tension, there was definitely occasional camaraderie. The picture on the right is showing, you know, Israeli soldiers, Jordanian soldiers passing back and forth, coffee, newspapers. There was interaction. Uh, and there were even some humorous stories, right? Probably the most famous one is this one over here on the left. Notre Dame, like we saw before over here, uh, is on the border. Notre Dame was not just a church. It was also a hospital. 
Um, and in one morning in 1956, one of the patients opened up her window to get some fresh air. Uh, and then she was overcome by a coughing fit. And she coughed so hard that she coughed her false teeth out of her mouth and out the window. Uh, and they fell down into no man's land. Uh, and so it wasn't just a matter of going to find them, but you had to call the United Nations and the Israelis and the Jordanians and have an entire uh, group of people go out there with the nun to go and look for the teeth. And this was such a great story that it was documented by a Life magazine photographer and put in an issue of Life magazine. So that's the picture over here of the nun when she finally found the teeth. Um, uh, okay, so let's go on. Oh, and one last thing about the border. And this is also, we saw this in the beginning. This is on the edge of Musrara, the one place where you could cross from Jordan into Israel not the other way. You could not go from Israel into Jordan with very, very few exceptions, uh, was the Mandelbaum Gate. Okay? Mandelbaum Gate was the, was the one place where you could go back and forth. Um, the exceptions are Israelis going into Jordan were the soldiers who served on Mount Scopus every two weeks. They were allowed to exchange soldiers and go up there, uh, and they passed through the Mandelbaum Gate. Uh, you also had the picture here on, uh, on the right, is of uh, Samaritans, Shomronim, right? The Samaritan community, very, very ancient community, divided in half in 1948, with some of them living on Mount Grizim in the Shomron, uh, which is their holy place, and some of them living in Cholon, right, near Tel Aviv. That they received special permission to go Passover up on Mount Grizim because that was the holy time for them. So this is them you know, taking all their stuff, their chinik and everything they need to cross over the border uh, and to go up to Mount Grizim. This picture over here on the left, this is nuns coming uh, from Israel to go to Beit Lachem, right? To go to Bethlehem for Christmas. So you had this passing back and forth, but very, very unusual circumstances. Otherwise, Jews coming from abroad definitely could not go uh, from Israel into Jordan or uh, nobody could do that, right? You could not travel from one place to the other. Um, today, the Mandelbaum Gate has been has disappeared. Um, it was actually destroyed very, very soon after uh, 1967. Teddy Kollek, the mayor of Jerusalem, says to destroy it. Uh, yeah, there wasn't a thought of, oh, this is a historical place. There was a thought of the cities reunited and let's just bulldoze all those things. So today, the only thing that's uh, a memory of the Mandelbaum Gate uh, is uh, this sundial which you can see on route number one. Uh, and the, the Israeli outpost that was right near it was called the Turjaman Post, an old building. Um, and you can see over here on the right, uh, for a while, it was a museum about the divided city. And like 25 years ago, they made it into this very avant-garde museum on the scene. Okay, let's go back to Musrara. And, and the bullet holes too. In the, in the 50s and in the 60s, okay? So you have what's happening in Israel, all over Israel, in the late 40s and the 50s and the 60s. You have this incredible influx of new immigrants, thousands of people arriving every month. In the first five years, I've said this many times, and it's a very important fact, the first five years of Israel's history, we double our population. We go from 600,000 to 1.2 million. Where are all those people going to go? Okay, so they are put into all sorts of places that have been emptied out because the Arabs have fled. So whether it's you know Arab places like Lud and Ramla, Arab cities, or mixed places like Haifa, or like Jerusalem, right? They're also eventually sent down to the borders in the Negev, right? To development towns like Netivot and Ofakim. But in the city, they're placed on the borders, right? Places like Musrara, because you can be a good human shield. So basically what happens is those beautiful houses that we saw before are carved up into tiny little one room places, right? With often, because it used to be a one, one family house, one bathroom, one kitchen for everybody, right? Because they're not putting in new bathrooms and new kitchens. Or there are new, very ugly buildings, right? Shikunim, these railroad flats that are being built. Take a look at the top. 
See what's on the top here? These are not windows. This is not for air. These are firing posts because you have to worry about snipers and you have to be able to shoot back. Okay, so there's these very uh, crowded, very uh, made out of concrete, very ugly. Uh, and they are most of the families that are put here, right? Who are the families that are brought here? You have people coming from North Africa, Iraqis, Persians, many of them with many children. And they're dumped in these tiny little quarters, right? And this is what's often called the second Israel, Israel Hashnia, right? All of these new immigrants who are coming. Um, and uh, they're not all created equal. So there are some immigrants who get preferential treatment and get better places to live. I'm not saying it was easy for them. It wasn't easy for anybody in Israel in the 50s. But by and large, the European Jews who came, first of all, came earlier. They came right after the Holocaust, as opposed to the Jews from Arab countries who came mostly after 48. Um, so the European Jews managed to grab hold of places that were a little bit better uh, in the cities, better located, right? There were also yesh vayesh among the Jews from Arab countries. Uh, Jews from Yemen were considered to be of a higher class. They were given better places, right? They're put in the center. Rosh Ha'ayin becomes a Yemenite town. Moroccan Jews, no, we don't like them as much. Let's dump them somewhere like Dimona or Nitivot, right? Or put them on the border. So you definitely have uh, good intentions, but not always very good uh, results. Um, and by the 50s and 60s in Musrara, more than a third of the population is on welfare. The conditions, the living conditions are terrible. The schools are terrible. Most of the kids, uh, many of the kids are dropping out to work. Um, and there's a small group that decides that they are going to create a protest movement. And this is in the late 60s. Right? And they call themselves Hapanterim Hashchorim, the Black Panthers. Right? Uh, and we'll see their influences in a minute. This is their symbol, right? The upraised fist. Uh, and they want to protest the conditions. They want to protest racism, right? It sounds strange to say racism. We're not talking about white and black, but they consider themselves to be Black Jews. Meaning, because of their ethnicity, they're discriminated against. Um, they do a lot of Robin Hood kind of things. They go out and they steal milk from when the milkman puts it out outside of people's houses. So they steal bread so they can feed poor families. They move into abandoned houses. Um, and uh, and the founders are all from Musrara, and they meet in Musrara. So we're talking about people like Charlie Beaton, Sadia Marziano, Ruven Abagil, uh, Coco, per Coco Derry, right? These are the names, and they're meeting, and they're getting together. Now, they're taking their name from the Black Panthers in America, right? Black Panthers in America who were already founded, uh, Black Power Movement founded to combat racism, but the Black Panthers in America were much, much more radical, right? They they carry guns, they fight the police. That's not what's happening here. Here we're really talking about um, civil disobedience more than anything else. Um, but we also have precedents in Israel, right? If you take a look at the picture all the way on the left, this is a picture from riots that took place at the end of the 50s, right? 10 years earlier than the Panterim Ashorim in a place called Wadi Salib in Haifa. Hey, uh, in Haifa, it was a story that you hear many places, uh, police violence spirals out of control, crazy riots that eventually led to a commission of inquiry to try to make things better for the Jews who are very socioeconomically depressed, but it doesn't really do much. But there are some precedents. Um, the Black Panther movement grows. It connects up with an organization that's called Matzpen, which is socialist, anti-Zionist. Right? Uh, and this is such a great picture because you can get all, all the fabulous hair and the styles and the, and the look uh, of the early 70s, late 60s and early 70s with these much more clean cut types uh, meeting up with each other. Uh, but the movement starts to grow. Uh, and they also find common cause somewhat with the Palestinians, by the way, if we talk about today intersectionality, they're talking about oppression and oppression for them cuts across all lines. Um, in 1971, they start having demonstrations. They refused permits, but they have them anyway. 
On May 18, 1971, it's called the Night of the Panthers. They have a huge demonstration from the Davidka Square in downtown Jerusalem to Zion Square. People are arrested, Molotov cocktails. And this is enough of uh, an issue that it gets the attention of Golda Meir, the prime minister. Okay? She meets with them. Uh, and she very famously says, and her words are kind of taken out of context, she says their tactics are not nice, but it becomes known as Golda says they're not nice boys, and that's the picture that we saw in the beginning. Um, despite the fact that her words are taken out of context, if you read the transcripts of this meeting, she's very tone deaf. She, she doesn't get it. She she says to them, well, why aren't you working? Why aren't you going to school? Right. They, they don't she doesn't really get the whole issue of what's going on and the and the society and how difficult it is. And she doesn't really do very much for them. So they get a little bit of money. They get a little bit of attention, but not much happens until we have the Mahapach, right? The revolution, the major revolution, 1977. Uh, Menachem Begin is elected, right? This upheaval, uh, taking apart 29 years of labor government rule. Menachem Begin is elected. Menachem Begin is the whitest of the whites, right? Look at him. He's such a Polish Jew, but, um, but he has a great love and is in turn very beloved by the Mizrahi Jews. He's very connected to them. He really understands them. And he says, I'm gonna do something for you. Uh, and he creates uh, an amazing project that, that's called Project Renewal, that partners with the Jewish agency and partners with UJA and federations all over the world to restore houses, to put in facil proper facilities, to make parks, this is not only in Musrara, this is all over the country, right? uh, and the Panthers really win in that way, uh, that they want to make the places that they have, that they don't raise these neighborhoods, but rather they take the existing neighborhoods and they improve them in a great way, uh, and that really is thanks to the Panthers and thanks to Menachem Begin. So today there are these uh, new signs that were put up, two new signs, two alleyways. One is the Black Panthers Way, and the other one is the one that we saw before, the Not Nice Alley. Um, and uh, one of the neighborhood projects that was done more recently, uh, 2005, is this mosaic that you see here, which is really a beautiful mosaic of all the things in the neighborhood. First of all, the different communities that the Jews are coming from here, Morocco, Iraq, Turkey, Kurdistan, okay? Uh, you have all the names of the streets around. You have the Panthers over here. Okay, so you have this this idea that from the community giving back to the community. So that's the the transformation, uh, and the transformation continues with this with Musrara becoming very much uh, an arts center. So a couple of really interesting buildings. Um, on the left here, you have, this is really on the edge of Musrara, it's getting much closer to Mansharm, but we'll call it Musrara for our purposes, uh, is the print workshop. This is a beautiful old building, as you can see. Uh, it's, it's one of the oldest buildings in the area. It's already on maps by 1876. Uh, it seems that it was... Uh, bought eventually by someone named Bay Turjaman, who also owned the, the Turjaman Post House. Uh, it was a tile factory, it was his home. It went through different hands. Probably its most colorful uh, resident was somebody named Rabbi Chaim Tzvi Paskovitz. He rented out the top floor. He was known as the Reuter Rebbe, the Red Rabbi, not because uh, he dressed like Santa Claus, but because he was a very fiery communist. Uh, and he had a shul where he would preach Torah and communism. He was one of the first uh, founders of the Israel-Soviet Union Friendship Pact, right? Very unusual guy. Uh, eventually leaves. He goes to America. He's arrested as a communist. Okay. But in the 70s, this building is bought by and used by uh, something called the Sadnata Hedpes, Jerusalem Print Workshop. Um, 
where they have all, use all kinds of old techniques, printing techniques. And you can go there today and you can see what they do. And they have a gallery and they have all these old machines. And it's a fascinating place. The building on the right is the, the Musrara Art School, a photography school, art school. Today it's being renovated, but it's an important building. Uh, it used to be uh, the school for the neighborhood that most of the Black Panthers went to. Um, and the other interesting story about it is that in September of 1948, um, the Israeli army tunneled under this building and tunneled all the way towards Damascus Gate and lay explosives there. After the ceasefire, they told the UN and the Jordanians about it, and they decided that they had to blow up the explosives because you can't just leave explosives. Who knows what's going to happen to them? Uh, and there was a lot of fear that it would damage the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Dome of the Rock. In the end, it was very, very minimal explosion that didn't bother anybody, but that was like a very big drama in 1949. Today, you have all sorts of interesting institutions in Musrara, uh, among them this place called Polis, which teaches ancient languages with modern methods, so Latin, Greek, Biblical Hebrew, Classical Arabic, right, all different kinds of things. Uh, there's the School of Middle Eastern Music. There's a photography school, there's the Male Film School, there's arts uh, celebrations like the Musrara Mix, right? All different kinds of interesting things. Um, but there are still old timers in the neighborhood and you have some of the older synagogues of the Yotze Bavel, right? You have interesting older synagogues. And then you have this very unusual story of the Silesian sisters, okay? This is um, a Catholic order that was founded by someone named Don Giovanni Bosco in the 19th century in Italy. They spread all over the world and they came to Jerusalem as well. And they have three buildings here, a school and a convent and a guest house. These are not the Silesian sisters in Jerusalem. This is just a picture of Silesian sisters somewhere else. Um, and uh, today it's just a, a very eclectic, very interesting neighborhood, which has some conflicts, uh, mostly between ultra-Orthodox and secular, but on the whole, it's uh, it's a very interesting island of, uh, I don't know if I would say coexistence, but multi-existence in Jerusalem. All right, let's see all these comments that I ignored and then let's see if there's anybody else. People wanted to say anything. Okay, St. Paul's Road Shift Israel, correct. Um, bullet holes, I don't know what you're saying. Bullet holes, Salch Shabbat, yes, definitely. Uh, Labor Party is anti sparty and anti-religious, yes, definitely. David Casuto is deputy mayor of Jerusalem. Um, she said that nice speaks Yiddish. I don't know what that quote is supposed to be about you, but you'll explain afterwards. Okay, uh, that was Wait, what- Let uh, me just one finish of, here, let me finish here. Statement. One second. Um, the mosaic is located on Ein Chet Street. If you walk down Ein Chet Street towards the old city, it's actually hung in a very stupid way. It's very high up and it's hard to see, but if you look for it, you'll find it. Um, Akkadian. I don't know what it, oh, they teach Akkadian. Do they teach Akkadian? Maybe. Okay, Batya, you please tell us the story. <laughs> All right, Golda Meir's statement had something to do with, you know, like the, to be nice Jewish boys, they have to speak Yiddish. Oh. And, the, um, and the, the thing was that, that Menachem Begin, because as a revisionist, he was on the outs of the elitists. Correct. And, uh, and so it, and he, he enjoyed the Sephardim, so that was a natural alliance, and that's why within um, Cheirut, which was the original, his part of, of Gachal, which became the Likud, you always had a lot of, of Sephardim. Outside of the, you can't mix them up with uh, someone like uh, the Navones because they were the old uh, Spanish Sephardim and they were considered- right. not, uh, not the Edota Mizrach. All right. Thank you, everyone. So next week, no class because uh, Purim, at least it will be Purim already here and you'll be getting ready for Purim. Uh, and the week after that, we will be back. So thank you, everyone, and have a good, quiet, peaceful week. Thank you thank again you. for everything. Thank you. Wonderful as always. Thank you. Thank you, Shuli. Purim Samir.
Forum Sommeyer. Thank you, Shuli. Thank you. I fell asleep.